Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 192, I Don't Want to Grow Up, games we played as kids that we still play today. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. Now we're back after a longer than expected break. Thank you for your patience and for being with us here on our return show. Now tonight we're going to be talking about games we grew up playing that we still enjoy to this day. Now to go with that, we've got a review of Racco as well as a review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, which is a hidden gem I think more people need to hear about. After that, we got a shorter than expected week in review based on how long it is since we last recorded, but there's still plenty of content there. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk and give feedback both positive and negative. One of the things that's kept us away from the mics has been that Mo and Deanna have been busy on the tabletop gaming deals side of the tabletop bellhop with all kinds of holiday sales hitting last month and some still going now. Yeah, Deanna's working on one right now over there. Yeah, it's, this is honestly the busiest time of year for us um, as far as that side of the business goes. And I encourage everyone to follow tabletop underscore deals on Twitter if you're still there. Uh, join the Good Geek Deals group on Facebook. Note it's a group, not a page. Or now follow Tabletop Gaming Deals, all one word, on Dice Camp, which is one of many Mastodon servers. So tonight's <laughs> feedback starts with some comments we got about our various deal promotions. Stark Maximum writes, thank you very much for keeping track of all the sales for us. That is an awesome name. Ben Balk says, thanks for this. Found at least a couple of games I wanted. <laughs> Jack William Gobble Jr. wrote to say, it probably should be said every day or every few hours. Thank you for the time and dedication to this list. Wow. In regards to the holiday sales landing page. Every couple of hours is a bit much. Maybe they're trying to make fun as how often we spam out. Yeah, stuff. I think that's, I think they're I, th I think that might your, be it. Yeah. <laughs> now, finally, at Lucky Newt Games says, thank you so much for this. Talked with my partner and we purchased three copies of the MHA board game, one for us, one is a white elephant gift uh, exchange with our gaming group, and one for my niece who loves MHA. Couldn't have afforded all the copies without the sale. Nice. And this is only a small sample of the positive yeah. feedback we received. Now, for those who don't know what MHA is, which I was included in until I had to do some Googling because I'm like, what the heck is that? I kept thinking Marvel Heroic Alliance or something. I am not a huge anime fan, and I'm sure if I was, I would know that meant My Hero Academia. Thanks, everyone, for the encouragement. Um, hearing people excited about the games they got, how much they saved, the gifts they found for people is actually a big part of what keeps us going, uh, especially on the long shifts during the, the big sale days. Of course, not everyone loves our landing pages, like the one person who signed up for our newsletter with the address, this is crap at yourwebsitesucks.com. Oh, well, you can't keep everyone happy. Note, they also didn't use crap, but we are not explicit here. We are a family-friendly show. All right, well, moving on to other comments, here's a great one from Patrick about the Ask the Bellhop segment from our last show. Laugh my ass off at your stages of a gamer talk. I think I hit all but the content creator phase. I learned more about you and your knowledge of gaming during that speech than listening to your shows. Much respect. You are the real deal. Wow. Uh, thanks so much for that, Patrick. That's awesome. A lot of really positive feedback. I think people wanted us back. Well, on the same topic, Wayner369 writes, This was a great and interesting discussion. It was interesting to hear about the stages I absolutely went through and mm -hmm. also stages I never thought about or heard put into words, but also went through. Cool. I think I've hit a mix of curator stage and blinger stage. I've become much more selective in what I buy the last couple of years. This started when I realized that even if I play a, a game a week, it would take me over three years to play <laughs> everything I own just once each. Don't let me do that math. 
Now, I also started buying nice upgrade bits off Etsy for the first time nice. about two months ago for select games, so I must be starting the Blinger stage. I don't think I'll ever hit the Plays with Strangers stage as the social experience with good friends is 80% of the fun of board games for me. Also not sure if I'll ever hit the Purge Culling stage, but you never know as you've described my gamer life cycle pretty accurately up to this point. It's coming. Thank you guys. I think this was my favorite episode you've done. Really hit close to home and was fun to listen to. Uh, glad to hear it. Thank you very much for the comment, Wayner. Uh, I, this one in particular was really good, especially that I didn't realize I'd been in some of these stages. Uh, what I really enjoyed about the comments on this particular topic are these type of comments where people were sharing their own experiences and where they are on the hobby gamer path. And I say, keep them coming. I would love to read out one of these a week for the next year where people talk about what part of the path they're on. I would love to hear about your journeys. Well, let's wrap this up the, uh, this week's feedback with our comment on our horror games we want to play on Halloween topic before it gets any more stale. Yeah. Well, Phil Hatfield writes, play a few of those games before I enjoyed and would recommend Legendary Aliens and, or Encounters Alien. Mm -hmm. Additional games on my list include Scooby-Doo the Board Game, Ghosts Love Candy 2, A Touch of Evil the Supernatural Game, and one that was on your list already, Horrified American Monsters. And for RPGs, my go-to game for Halloween horror is Chill. Nice. But I would also suggest Forsaken and an old throwback version 2.2 Twilight 2000 with the <laughs> Twilight Nightmares module. There were several great horror adventures in the Twilight Nightmares module, module that you could run. Well, thanks for the comment, Phil, and the game suggestions. Um, of all of those, I, want, I love the mention of Chill. Back in the 90s, Chill was my horror game. It was the one horror game that I actually enjoyed playing. And honestly, I would still list it as my favorite horror game system, though I haven't played it in years. Um, I just enjoyed the kind of, uh, it predates the term, but the Men in Black theme of protecting the world from the darkness they don't know about. And I found the system personally to be more enjoyable than Chaos Aim's basic system used in Cthulhu. Just wasn't a fan of that system. That said, oh, it's been so long since I played Pil Chill, there's probably a better horror game out there now, but I haven't played it. So I, right now it's Schrodinger's horror role-playing game. Until I play it again, it's still the best horror game out there. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback by commenting on our posts, emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com, sending us a message, or tagging us on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, what games did you grow up playing that you still enjoy and play today? So this is a question that gets asked now and then, mainly on social media, enough times that I can't pin it down to one particular person asking. We basically had three questions in our question list that were all asking the same kind of thing. And it comes up a lot when we'll post nostalgia. I find when I share my memories, say on Facebook, of an old game and people are like, oh, but do you still play it, right? And then usually it'll be, do you still play it? And then someone's, what other games from your childhood do you still enjoy playing? And so on. So it's kind of an organic question that we've been asked a number of times that I thought would be a fun topic that also ties in well with tonight's review. So I kind of thought we'd wrap everything together here to kind of make a theme for the entire episode. You know, sometimes these questions are about older games that still get played. People are looking for hobby board games that are, you know, five or 10 or more years old. But in this case, we want to highlight even older games, mm -hmm. games we played when we were kids. I'm thinking young kids to early teens. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Like, I can think of plenty of great games that I loved back then that I would still be perfectly happy to play today. Absolutely. Thankfully, my parents didn't really buy kids games mm. and just played their games with us that are now in my collection. Nice. I wish I could have got my dad's collection off him, but unfortunately he sold it. Well, not unfortunately for the guy, but he sold it to someone he played games with all the time, which makes sense. I wish I had gotten some of those games, though. For me growing up, it was a mix, but I'll admit most of the, the real kids games, except for a few, didn't make the list tonight because most older kids games just weren't that great. Now, as usual, this list is in no particular order and is in no way inclusive. These mm -hmm. are the games that we used to love 
that we will enjoy, not a list of all the great games that were out when we were kids that are still fun. I have to throw that caveat on there just to, to kind of curb back some of the comments we get, no matter what we make a list about. Heck, some of the games, honestly, on this list may not be great games, uh, but our existing joy in still playing them probably comes from a bit of a place of nostalgia and rather than mechanics that actually happen to stand the test of time. Sometimes it's just a hit of feelings you need more than an objectively great game. Heck, there's one of them that's on my list that, that I, I would almost say is a bad game now and day that's been improved, but it's going to make the list tonight. All right, I am going to start off with the only standard board game box style game that looks like a kid's game that you picked up at the, the local department store and the only real kid's game on my list, and that is Cats from Chieftain Games, uh, which I later learned was called Cats Mansion in the U.S. when I think it was published by Parker Brothers, but I'm, I couldn't, don't, don't, don't quote me on that one. So Cats is a hidden role game where you have five cats on the board and the board kind of looks like clue and there's four presents on the board. Well, you play four players and you randomly are assigned a cat. You don't tell anyone which cat you are. And then you're really randomly assigned a present you're trying to get to. Then on your turn, you get so many movement points and you can move cats or presents. And the whole goal is to get your cat to match up with your present. And if you do that, you win. Now, the whole thing is, if you start rushing towards that mouse with the gray cat, everyone else is going to figure out, well, you're obviously the gray cat trying to get the mouse and mess with you and do everything possible to try to get you to not get it. Now, along with this, there's different rooms and there's these meow cards that cause the cats to run all over the house. And then there's purr cards to say, no, my cat doesn't move. And there's a whole bunch of take that. But it's a brilliant game with that whole you don't know who's playing what. And like there's modern games like um, Quicksand that kind of use the same mechanic. But I just love cats probably because I grew up with it. Plus, it still has the best player pawns I've ever seen in a game ever. Yeah, no, there are some, we had some fantastic times playing this, both rules as written and maybe a little less so. <laughs> yes. But that was Cats or Cats Mansion in the US. Now, my first game is actually International Movie Maker, which is this one right up here. Uh, a roll and move much like Monopoly, but without the same level of evolving board ownership that makes it honestly much more fun as the game goes on than Monopoly. You're trying to make movies by collecting a story, a director, male and female stars, and a number of locations, depending on the type of story, and make a movie before trying to profit off that movie or often watch it flop and <laughs> lose all your money. Now, while it is highly random and it's very much a roll and move, it hits a spot that Monopoly never could for me. It almost seems like it's got aspects of game of life with all the stuff you're collecting along the way. Uh, a little bit, but it is just the, you know, around the edge of the board. Yeah. There's no, there's no paths or anything like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, despite knowing Sean for years, I don't think I ever played this one with you. No, no, this was a family, this was a, like a, yeah. only a family game sort of thing. Yeah, I never, reason. I never played this one growing up. That was International Movie Maker. Next, I've got Clue, the classic Hasbro deduction game. While I don't love it, Deanna got me to try this game as an adult. Like, I didn't grow up playing a ton of Clue. Like, I played it a couple times. But she made me try it with her copy, and I was like, why are we keeping that? Why do we have Clue? She's like, the Clue's actually good. So we sat down and we played it. And I gotta say, for an older roll and move game, I found a lot to like. Now, I'm not rushing out to buy any new edition or making sure we need a deluxe copy, but or even honestly playing this multiple times a year. But if I sat down with a group and they're like, hey, tonight we're playing Clue, I'm not going to say no. I also grew up playing Clue. And while some modern versions like the Harry Potter one my family got and we've talked about previously can ruin the game, yes. uh, others, especially more classic versions, can continue to make this an enjoyable family game for all problem solvers. And that was Clue. And now my next game is Spellmaker. That's this one right up here. Uh, this is a quirky 1970s rescue the princess game. You're playing a wizard in his tower, trying to guide a princess back to your domain and throwing around a simple selection of smell spells, making use of knights, frogs, toadstools, trolls, and more. <laughs> now in its rules as written form, the game is not without its issues, though it's clearly got a game there. 
and experimentation with house rules often came up with some wildly fun games. Mm. Now, interestingly, I learned today that the game as sold and the game as designed actually differ. Interesting. And the designer did an interview in uh, White Dwarf magazine that said, if you do this to the deck of cards, it speeds up and improves the game back to what we had designed. Huh. Uh, interestingly, my sister actually requested that we play that this that game this Christmas. Oh, and so nice. I plan on introducing the designer's original changes into the game for that. I look forward to hearing that in a future Bellhops tabletop to know if it can be improved. This is another one I'd never even heard of. You that and I was, actually had played, I think, we had? once or twice, but it okay. was not rules as written. It was, let's see what we yeah, do with this Yeah, let's goof around with the game. Okay, maybe that's possible. I don't remember this one, we'll say. <laughs> that was Spellmaker. Uh, next up, I have Waterworks. This is a card-based pipe-laying card game that actually reminds me of some modern tile-laying games. Like, I get a kind of Carcassonne vibe from this. You play pipes trying to make a full circuit, like a completed pipe works. I don't know how I don't know how to word that, but you're trying to basically get the the, the faucet to come out the other end um, while also playing broken pipes on your opponents and things like that. One of the highlights of this game were these little metal wrenches that were on there that you played on your pipes to repair them. And honestly, this is one we found while clearing out my parents' house to sell it. I found my dad's old copy. And Deanna was like, well, we got to play it. So we actually sat down and played it. And I'm like, wow, that's that's like not bad. Like, I remember liking it as a kid, but it, I remember more just building giant pipe work things than actually trying to play the game. I also, there's actually a modern version of this um, published by Jamie Chambers, uh, who I knew on G Plus called Building an Elder God, which is Cthulhu meets Waterworks. All right. Uh, and it's amusing that you refound this through your dad's copy because it was actually my copies. My family actually had two copies. So we had the okay. double size with all the extra wrenches and you could play more players. Uh, and we used to play that in the basement uh, going all the way back to mm -hmm. Rankin, the original house. Yeah. Uh, I'm not actually sure where my copy right, uh, is right now, but I would absolutely play that again. And that is Waterworks. Now, next up, my game is the classic Uno. Now we, and probably most people, played the uh, this extreme with stacked mm -hmm. pickup cards. It was still yep. a fun game, and one that I introduced to my kids and still play with them to this day. Yeah, Uno is a game I did play with the kids. I have we have a copy in the minivan that we're like when we're on road trips or whatever. They they brought a copy when they went up to Algonquin Park. That was one of the games we played. I'm not a huge fan. If anyone recommends I play Uno, I'll probably do it, but I might recommend something else. That was Uno. Speaking of classic card games, the next one I have is Racco. Uh, Deanna and I recently rediscovered this one due to them having a copy at the Banded, Bruce, Banded Goose Brewery in Kingsville. Uh, tune into our review segment, which follows this one, to learn more about Racco. And that was Racco. Now, my next one isn't a specific game, but rather a group of games. Those being traditional card games, because I, if I just did this list, I almost could just go <laughs> traditional card games. I still play and it would be an extensive list. It's games you use a standard deck of cards. My parents were huge card game players. Uh, my mom still today, right now, while we are recording, my mom is at the Moose Lodge playing cribbage. So that is something they, they, that my mom still does. Uh, always. My parents always had a deck of cards. Anytime we were going to be somewhere for an hour or more and there was a table involved, cards got played. Uh, as well, I got taught multiple different solitaire versions. Like I like traditional solitaire, like, but there's one called Clock I love, another one called King's Corner that I will happily play to kill time. But more importantly, it was the group game. Spades, Hearts, and Euchre being the big three, my favorites, as well as big group games like Past the Ace and 31, which were usually the big parties with the ball teams and, and or even my own birthday parties at the Knights of Columbus, we played these games. And to this day, if someone invites me to play a game of cards, I'll play a game of cards with them. Now, I'd probably rather play like Macaron as a trick-taking game, but these are the games that everyone knows, right? Like you can sit down. Most people already know how to play the basics, even crazy eights, right? Instead of Uno, I'd rather play crazy eights than Uno in most cases. I just standard card games like I haven't gotten sick of them and I don't think I will. And I just I don't think people do get sick of them. 
and it's, there does set, definitely seem to be some sort of a French Canadian influence because yeah. I know it, it seems to be that side of my family and that side of my wife's family who always were the card players. So that was traditional card games. Now, my next game is the game of life, but not the new one. Now, <laughs> yes, I'm aware the old one has got some problematic content in it. But when they changed those parts, they changed the gameplay as well. And that's what I miss, as well as the fantastic components mm -hmm. that have also been eliminated from most, if not all, modern versions of the game. Like you used to get glass bottles for your your pegs that were your people that were actually pegs and like the nice molded cars and, you know, real physical components. And, you know, you could flip open the. Uh, the box that held all the cash and it turned into a, a way of stacking out your mm -hmm. cash. All the little touches like that have just kind of gone by the wayside to uh, help, you know, keep the price down, I guess. I got to say for a roll and move game, I like this one because there were decision points. That was the big thing. I'm like, to me, that made that game. The fact I got to choose, do you go to college or not? I think was the first decision you made in that game. And, and there were reasons to go both ways and, do you want to rush to the end or do you want to take your time and possibly buy the big house? I, I really enjoyed life. I don't know if I'd enjoy it now. Like I couldn't put this on the list because I haven't replayed the game of life in years. I think we played it with Sean Skolak on the PlayStation. I had some version of the game of life and that was fun. But there was all these like weird spinners and randomizers, which was stuff you can only do on a PlayStation. So I don't even think that counts. Yeah, I had played the new the new version and was disappointed by it because yeah. of, of those reasons. But uh yeah, I still uh, still have a love for it. Just a, a side note, I had that problem with Operation. I used to like Operation, and the new version removed the cards. It was just a pure dex to take a turn, try to get something out. If you buzz, you miss the rest of your turn. Oh, they geez. took out, like, the game of it. How weird. Yeah, I thought it was really strange. Cat and Tori won a copy of it in Extra Life Auction because they had heard about it, uh, which was pretty funny. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's a side note. We were actually talking about the game of life, which is on this list. Next, of all games, I have Connect 4. Yes, it's super simple. Yes, when both players are experienced and both paying attention, which is important, you often end up with a tie game. But there's something about Connect 4 that's still fun after all these years. Nowadays, when I play Connect 4 is when we stumble upon it. We, we check out Cafe March 21, downtown Windsor, that we're told has good ramen. We're sitting waiting for our ramen, and there's a copy of Connect 4 on a shelf over there you can grab. And sure enough, we grab it and we're like, you know, this is actually quite fun. Or we're at a pub having a few pints and there's a copy of Connect 4. And that's where it actually gets challenging because you lose that focus and make stupid mistakes. Uh, another thing I dig, though, that I didn't even know about until discovering at a cafe March 21 and doing Googling is there are a number of house rules that to me make it a game. With my favorite being what they call blind Connect 4, where you can't see the board. And what you have to do is go, I have Connect 4. And then you reveal it and see if you have it. If you have Connect 4, you win. If you don't, the opponent loses. And I love that version of the game where there's a memory element there, and I think there's even some there's some social stuff there. Like, you're going to be bluffing, like, no, no, you don't have over there. I remember I put this here, and then you put this, and I don't know. I, Connect 4 is probably, like, the, the, the silliest kids game on my list, but still I enjoy playing it in the right atmosphere. You know, it was funny you brought that up because uh, when we were at our company dinner, at the big at the company conference uh, a month or so ago, uh, or I guess a couple, yeah, back in September, um, <laughs> when we were, it, we, we, it was a they went to a, a billiard hall, but one yep. of the things they had was a giant mm -hmm. Connect Four board, like probably two and a half, three feet tall by three feet wide Connect Four board with big honking wooden yep. uh, wooden pieces. So yeah, no, I, I definitely agree, and that was Connect Four. All right, yeah. so we have a bunch of people in the chat saying they're hearing an alert sound. Yeah, there was a noise. It was, there was a okay. noise. I didn't uh, hear a noise on my end, so. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, um, talking about Giant Connect 4, if you ever go to any of the events in Kingsville, Ontario, Kingsville, Ontario has a very beautiful downtown that they do, they close off the streets so people can walk and they do pedestrian. They have a Giant Connect 4 at that. And my kids, every time they go, insist they have to stop and play a game of Giant Connect 4. Cool. So uh, my next game is Upwards. 
the Scrabble knockoff, according to some. <laughs> but personally, I have always found the flexibility you get in Upwards refreshing. While Scrabble tends to reward learning obscure words that basically only exist for use in Scrabble, yeah. Upwards, you can actually use real words and, and make them count. Yeah, Scrabble people could, have been trying to convince me that it's a hobby gamer game and that it's actually an area majority game or area control game where the words don't matter. It's what spaces you're taking up. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I am not a Scrabble fan. I read a lot of books, but Sean and Deanna that do my editing know how bad my, uh, my spelling and my dyslexia can be. So just not a game for me. Whereas I do prefer Upwards, though I will admit Deanna loves Upwards. We still have her copy. Um, she loved it growing up and still enjoyed it, but she took it out and like taught me to play it. And I just, I didn't love it. Like it, it, it was okay, but like, I would rather play like for word games. I like boggle the boggle. I possibly could have put on this list, but again, I don't really like word games. <laughs> like I like playing boggle with someone that's on the same level as me, but like I play boggle against Deanna and I just feel like it's a, it's futile. I'm like, I found 20 words. She's like, I found 172 and 20 of them are yours. You get no points. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's one of the things the chat room actually brought up earlier on about when talking about Upwards is it really does matter who you're playing it with. Yeah. And that goes for all the word games, really. Like, I mean, and the same with math games, right? You don't want to play math games with uh, Albert Einstein. <laughs> you know, yes. It's, it's, you got you to gotta play with the right people. Yes, you don't play Planet Steam with Charles. I learned <laughs> that one. Speaking of Charles, next I have Chess. Um, I have very fond memories of my parents' marble chess set, one of the more expensive things in our house that was always on display. And at some point, me hitting the age where my dad brought it out into the front room and taught me to play chess. I have no idea what age that was, but I do remember heading to my family Christmas party and destroying some of my uncles. So that's just like a, a formative moment as a kid that, hey, I can beat parents at games that probably is part of what made me sit in this chair talking to you tonight. Um, well, I never played chess hardcore i never looked into standard openings or any stuff like that i still enjoy sitting down to a game of chess so again this is another game where as long as you're kind of on the same level yeah my uh my son loves chess and plays right. plays with some of his friends and plays chess.com but i and it's one of the things i feel guilty about i can't really play chess against him because he is so far <laughs> beyond me. Yeah. I can't really challenge him. I, I I was never a strong chess player. Uh, it was just never something I really did. I mean, I knew the rules, but that was yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, so that was chess. All right. Next, I have the generals. This is one a lot of people haven't heard of. This was one of my dads, and it's basically electronic streak Tigo. Now, the awesome part about this game is due to the fact it used a computer. You never break the fog of war. So when you're playing Stratego and your two units face, you have to show them both. So you both get to see what unit it is before it's destroyed. And then there's a whole memory element of the game of what unit was that. But it's a fairly simple one. On this one, when two units meet up, you place them on this special spot on the side of the board. You push them both down and it plays some music and tells you who won. Note, this is like 80s music, right? It's not like there's a big fanfare or anything. Well, the goal of the game is to capture the opponent's flag. And then there was also the neat mechanic where the lowest strength unit, which was the bomb, could defeat the toughest strength unit, which was the general, but was diffused by any of the other characters. And then there was a spy and stuff like that. But the whole thing here was that fog of war where you would battle two units. And unless they were the exact same unit and you got a tie, you didn't actually learn what that opponent was, only that they were tough enough to beat yours or you were tough enough to beat them. To me, it was Stratego plus a level. Now, the problem with this one is, well, I would love to play it nowadays. Um, somewhere I've found like someone had done a digital version online and I played it and was like, yeah, the game's still good. I have no way to play this now. I would happily play it. But my dad's copy was one of the ones that had batteries left in it for probably 40 years by the time we discovered it. And it wasn't just the white caked on stuff like it had done some real damage and it was not in a rescuable shape when I found it. And looking online, there are some reasonably priced copies, but not enough to, to win out over, you know, spending my money on a brand new shiny game. And that was the unfortunately acidified acid. <laughs> They're the generals. <laughs> the acidified acid. <laughs> the acidified acid. See, the, the, the strobing Sauron's eye goes off. 
All right, for my last game, my last board game, I'm going to finish off with what I consider my introduction to hobby gaming. To go back to our last episode, see, even a month apart, I got continuity there. Talking about my board game journey, when I moved into hobby games, that would have been Talisman 2nd Edition from Games Workshop. I fell hard into this game, like hard. I eventually managed to seek out and pick up every expansion, which nowadays sounds like you go online and order them all. Back then, that mainly meant going to Toronto in the only Games Workshop specialty store in Michigan to find these games, because at the time, Games Workshop was still only in the UK, and you had to import everything. I grabbed every White Dwarf magazine with additional rules. For anyone who remembers the advanced careers, that's where that came from. Made it actually feel like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And I even tried to collect a full set of miniatures for the game. That is the one thing I did fail on. I never got them all. Now, around the same time, I also got into Dungeon Quest, Fury of Dracula, Blood Bowl, other Games Workshop games. But of all of them, Talisman's the one I keep playing. My copy of Blood Bowl is right there behind me. You can see it on the picture. I don't remember the last time I took that out and actually played it. We talk about it. Sean's in Windsor. Maybe we'll actually do it, but I haven't touched that game in years. Meanwhile, Talisman tends to come out at least once a year. It seems like just as a a, a great, ver- I don't know. It, it's The game has its problems. It's going to take us forever. And yes, you right when you're about to win, someone will do something to set you back. And it's got the munchkin problem of never ending and everything else. And yes, the modern versions are improvements. You get that same talisman feel in a much more reasonable time frame, but just nothing quite matches playing the original second edition with all the stuff. You got to have it all in all the extra boards, the flipping timescape and all the characters use the minis. If you have them, you know, you got to have it all there. For me, that is an awesome game night. That is a, 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 fantastic game to sit down invite older friends over that i've known for years and play some talisman and that was talisman second edition with all the bells and whistles yes so the one thing we didn't really get into here are rpgs and i have two i think are worth mentioning so first up is tsr's marvel superheroes this was my first ever rpg experience no i did not start with D. my first box was a yellow box starter set Over the years, I ran many games of this for my friends and family and picked up a ton of different content from the game, including the advanced rules and all the other stuff. Now, what surprises me the most about this game is just how well it still plays to this day. While the tone of comic books has definitely changed since then, and when I run the game, we now play it as a retro game, like you are playing 80s comic book characters. You're not playing the modern versions, you're playing the 80s versions with the 80s style storylines, as cheesy as some of them were, like the clone saga from Spider-Man. Um, and But the mechanics still work great. Like, it's actually a fairly rules-light system, especially if you just play with the basic rules. Now, sure, there's some wonky bits, like spending your XP to modify your die rolls and specific karma rewards, but that whole universal table and area-based movement system still stands the test of time. And well, you know how I what I think about superheroes. So that was <laughs> Marvel Superheroes from TSR. Now the other RPG that I got into in my teens and will still happily play or run today is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I got to this through Talisman. Talisman introduced me to Games Workshop, which led me to Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which led me to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Wolfrup was my system long past my 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 childhood past my teens into my tweens into my 20s and is still probably the rpg system i know best that said the newest fourth edition really does look like it goes back to the roots and may become a new love i'm talking about in 20 years from now uh unlike mo uh, i didn't start with marvel mo started pre- prior to me with his marvel addiction and i actually started with warhammer fantasy roleplay uh, that was where I got my uh, my start to role playing, and uh, still have serious love for that game. Yeah. And I, I agree that I think the fourth edition uh, really could uh, bring it all back to us. And that was Warhammer Fantasy Role Play. Yeah. All right. Well, enough reminiscing about good old games. That's it for our list of games we loved it as kids that we will happily play today. Now, what are some games from your childhood that you still play and enjoy? Tell us about them in the comments. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. If you got a question for us, head to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word.
Welcome to our review of Racco, a classic card game that stands the test of time. So Racco was designed by Frank Whitehead, who started inventing board games back in 1937. Racco was his first commercial success, published by the Milton Bradley Company in 1956. Now, one thing I learned that I think is fantastic uh, nowadays, especially, is that the Whitehead family continues to receive royalties for this game even now. This very quick-to-learn card game plays two to four players with a single round of the game only taking 10 to 15 minutes when you include shuffling and dealing out all the cards. Unfortunately, a full game to the rulebook suggested 500 points will take significantly longer, oh, yeah. with most of the games lasting around two hours total. Now, the most recent version of Racco, which is the version we all now play, comes from a collaboration between Winning Moves and Hasbro, and has an MSRP of only 1550 So in Racco, every player is dealt a set of 10 cards, which they're going to put into a plastic card holder in the order they were dealt. No rearranging your cards. On your turn, you draw a card, either from the top of the deck or the discard pile, swap it with one of the cards on your rack, trying to get your entire rack to be in order. Now, to see the number cards and the plastic racks that come with this current edition of this classic card game, check out our somewhat tongue-in-cheek Racco unboxing video on YouTube. Oh, I had fun recording that one, I do have to admit. So here you'll see the simple four page black and white looks like they're photocopied instructions, 60 numbered cards and four plastic racks to hold them. Now, I will admit I was disappointed to see that this current version of the game puts racks of the same color. Previous editions and ones I played had two different colors, which was actually on purpose because there is a team based variant. Now, the trays are solidly made and the cards are of excellent quality. The box also fe features a trough-like box insert that does nothing to actually help keep the cards from sliding around once you remove them from the shrink. Yeah, there's also a lot of air in this box. So this box was obviously designed for shipping potentially and shelf presence, not for actually transporting the game around once you've opened it up. Well, now that we know what you get with a copy of Racco and an idea of what the copy you found in your grandma's basement should have, Let's move on to how to play this classic card game. So to start a game of Racco, you start by building the deck. You use all the cards with four players or 10 less cards for each missing player down to two, with the highest numbered cards being removed first. For example, in a two player game, you only use the cards numbered one to 40. This is one of those monopoly or free parking like rules most people tend to miss. The deck of cards is then shuffled well, and every player draws a card from the deck. The player with the highest card becomes the dealer. You then gather all those cards up again and shuffle them again, while the dealer does the work this time, and deals 10 cards to each player, one card at a time. Players take these cards as they're dealt and load them into their personal plastic tray in the order they were dealt, starting at 50 and working down. It's important to make sure no one is sorting their cards. Yes. These cards need to be in a random order for the game to work. Now, after everyone has their 10 cards, the dealer places the deck in the center of the play area and flips the top card over to form a discard pile. Play then starts with the player to the left of the dealer. On your turn, you draw one card either from the top of the deck or the top of the discard pile. If you took a discard, you must use that card to replace any one card in your rack, which is in turn discarded. If you draw from the deck, you can replace a card in your rack or discard the card you just drew. Play continues until a player gets all the cards in the rack in numerical order from high to low, top to bottom. Sorry, low to high, top to bottom. I almost messed that up. They then yell, Racco! The round ends and everyone calculates their score. The player, who he called Racco, scored 75 points. 50 for a full rack, plus 25 bonus points for getting a Racco. With every other player scoring 5 points per card that are in numeric order, starting from the bottom and stopping just before the card that breaks the train. The plastic racks have numbers next to each slot to make this calculation easier. Next, the deck is gathered and passed to the player on the left of the dealer who becomes the new dealer and another round starts. The game continues until at least one player reaches 500 points and then the player with the most points wins. That's it for the basic rules of Racco, which honestly were all that were included in at least one copy of the game I looked at. 
Now, over the years, there have been a number of variations added to these rules by different publishers. Here are the most common. The two-player variant. You can't call Racco in a two-player game unless you have at least three consecutive cards. Partners. Four players play two-on-two two with players sitting opposite each other, combining their scores. This makes for a much quicker game. Bonus Racco. The player who scores Racco will get bonus points for every perfect run of three to six cards in their rack, even be able to score multiple runs if they have it. This is my personal favorite variant that encourages players to not just get a Racco as quickly as possible and actually try to get at least one run before going out. Well, that's it for how to play Racco. It really couldn't be much simpler. But why are we even talking about Racco here on a hobby board game podcast? Because I couldn't wait until April 1st. <laughs> So here's the one thing, one of the things my wife and I really enjoy doing uh, when we have the time to fit it in is to spend a night or two in Kingsville, Ontario, which always consists of having some pints of beer at the Bandit Goose Brewery and often staying overnight at Inn 31 above Jack's Gastro Pub. Uh, you can send your checks, Jack's, to the mail for me promoting you all the time. Not actually a true thing. Great places, though. Now, on one of these trips, we noticed the brewery had an old beat up copy of Racco, and I grabbed it one day to play on the patio. It was then that I learned Deanna had never actually played Racco. This shocked me because Racco was just a game I grew up playing. Like I played it with friends. I played it with my parents. I even remember playing it with my grandmother who had her own copy at her house and broke it out for us to play. Racco to me was just one of those games everyone I knew had a copy of, which led me to think most people grew up playing this classic game. Now, I had heard of the game. I remember seeing it around but I've never actually played it until this year. Yeah, so I guess it just wasn't as ubiquitous as I thought. So here we are at Bandit Goose, and I Google the rules online. Remember, I said it's a beat-up copy. Of course, there were no instructions in it. And you know what? We had a great time playing after that. I fully expected that my fond feelings for this game were tied purely to nostalgia. And that's not the case. There's really solid game here that I managed to actually stand the test of time and still be fun these many years later. So one of the things that makes this game enjoyable is that Racco is dead simple to learn. Mm -hmm. Get 10 cards, put them in your rack in the order you get them, get a new one, get a card, a discard, uh, or slot it. You know, that's it. Everything, try and get everything in order. And sometimes you just want a super simple game where you don't have to think all that much. The thing is, though, Racco isn't that simple. Paying attention to what cards your opponents are discarding watching where in their rack they're pulling cards from that they're getting rid of, remembering what cards are still potentially in the deck, or more importantly, sometimes what's already buried in the discard pile, and being careful with what you discard because there's a chance that player to your left might be waiting for that exact card to go out, are all imports of playing Racco, if you care. And that's what I really love about this game. You can play it technically. You can tactically. You can, you can watch every move. You can even bluff your opponents or using your ability to read other players to your advantage. Or you can barely pay attention, drawing new cards, putting them in what seems like the best place at the time. Yeah. On the other hand, you can also play this game completely casually, barely yeah. paying attention to what you're doing. And because of this, we think Racco is the perfect game for a casual night. A yeah. night where the focus is on hanging out, chatting, and having a good time with friends or family, and there just happens to be gaming, being a game being played while that's going on. Yeah. Now, there is one serious problem with this game, and that's how long it takes to finish a full game according to the rules as written. A full game of Racco goes to 500, okay? So even if a single player wins every round with a perfect score, it will take you seven rounds to finish this game. And if each round takes about 10 minutes to finish, you're looking at a minimum of an hour and 10 minutes, and that's with perfect play. Now, we've had rounds of Racco go over the three-hour mark, with our average game being closer to two. And honestly, like, two-hour game's not bad for a game of Terraforming Mars, but for a silly, simple, casual game, it's a bit much. Now, to help counter this, we recommend the variants we talked about earlier. Most yeah. of them speed up the gameplay by giving players a way to score additional points. Yeah, the only one that doesn't is the two-player version. It actually gets longer with two players. To us, Racco is a true classic that really has stood the test of time. This is honestly one of the first games I remember ever playing, and it's a game I was shocked to learn still had appeal over 40 years later. 
If you attend or host casual game nights, Racco is a great game to have on hand. It's perfect for playing while socializing. For those that grew up playing Racco, I encourage you to dust off your copy if you still have it, or maybe pick up a new version and give it another go. I think there's a good chance you may fall in love with the game all over again, just like we did. Now, for the card gamers out there, the players of living card games, collectible card games, and even traditional trick-taking games, you're not going to find any comparable level of strategy or tactics here in Racco. But you may just find Racco is a great break when you need a break from deck construction or your next Euchre tournament. So that's it for our review of Racco, a classic game that stands the test of time. Is there a game in your collection that you th think still might be around in 70 years? Huh. Let us know about it in the comments. Now, before I go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of Racco over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com with some pictures of this classic game. Welcome to our review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade a deck builder that brings some new twists and classic anime IP to the genre. One thing before we get going, a big thanks to Japanime Games for providing us with a review copy of this card game. Yeah, thanks a lot for that one, actually. Uh, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade was designed by Johan Benvenuto and Florian Syriax and features licensed artwork from the anime. It was published in 2019 as a joint effort between Don't Panic Games and Japanime Games. This deck building card game with, a, with board game elements plays one to four players with games lasting up to 90 minutes. It features a low MSRP of only $59.95, which is a steal for what you actually get in the box. Mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is a competitive deck building game where players take on the roles of bounty hunters, Spike, Edward, Jet, and or Faye, the main characters from the show. These space cowboys will be traveling between their ship, the Bebop, and three planets trying to earn bounties on criminals. This is done through a deck building system with four resources, one of which carries over round to round. Win two different ways to take your targets down by fighting them head on and risking filling your deck with wound cards or investigating them, which is harder but less risky. A variable card market and a thematic semi-co-op system where you can use special abilities of other characters, whether they like it or not, are great ways to tie in the theme. This theme is reinforced through a space-based like card combo system and the climax of the game, which features a final hunt for Vicious himself. One of the things that really stands out about this game is the component quality, which mm -hmm. you can check out in our Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade unboxing video on YouTube. Inside this box, you're going to find both miniatures and standees for the characters, a molded plastic box insert, dual layer player, player and planet boards, a stand to hold the, and display the bounty boards, bounty cards, sorry, counters, cubes, and of course, large cards, lots and lots of cards. Should I just redo that sentence? Like, I don't even know what happened there. I just started falling out the Eye of Sauron. We need the Eye of Sauron. I don't know where the Eye of Sauron is on the Eye of Sauron time. Okay, I'm going to try that again. I don't even know. I just like started slurring halfway through. <laughs> <clears throat> Inside the box, you'll find both miniatures and standees for the characters, a molded plastic box insert, dual layer player and planet boards, a stand to hold and display bounty cards, counters, cubes, and of course, cards. Lots and lots of cards. These cards are of excellent quality and feature very clear layout and iconography, as well as plenty of text when needed. The rulebook is honestly fantastic. Uh, this includes a one page description of deck building that is super well written to the extent I think every deck builder, every publisher should have a copy of this page in it that just teaches you the basics of how deck building works. Well, now that we know what you get with this anime themed game, let's dive in to how to play. So Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade starts with everyone picking a character to play and taking their starter deck, which includes four unique cards for that character and six standard for a few Wulongs cards. They place a cube on the one spot on their fuel marker, shuffle their deck, and draw five cards. Their mini is placed on the Bebop, which is placed in the center of the table, along with the three planets, each with a cube on the one spot of their movement gauge. That's the movement gauge on the planets. 
Interestingly, miniatures for any character not being played are also placed mm -hmm. on the Bebop. These are non-player characters that can be affected by some card play. Additionally, players can use non-player characters' abilities when at the same location as them. Now, the market cards are shuffled and placed on their little cardboard holder, and an initial market of five cards is revealed. The wound deck is shuffled and placed on its cardboard holder. Next, the Big Shot Bounty deck is created. This is the most complicated part of setup, which involves splitting the cards by planet, finding ones worth zero points, placing one bounty on each player board, removing some cards based on the player count, and seeding the vicious card in the bottom of the deck, which is then placed on the bounty board. Sorry, Sean said player board. That was supposed to be planet board. That was my mistake in the notes. You're placing one bounty on each planet, so there's someone to hunt down on each of the planets. Finally, tokens are placed on these bounties that are on the planets. Now, these are two stacks of tokens for each bounty, and the number of tokens to place is indicated on the bounty card. Now, play begins with the jazziest player. Yeah. <laughs> or a grab chwazi. Each turn, players take any of five actions any number of times in whatever order they wish. They can play a card from their hand, but most cards provide one or more of, more of four resources, with many cards also having additional abilities mm -hmm. as well. Now, some cards also have a team effect combo ability when that, uh, that goes off when the card is played after a previously played card that matches the color of the combo section of the card. Think Star Realms. The resources you can gather in this game are fuel, which carries over from turn to turn and is used to move around the boards as well as activate special abilities. Wulongs, which are used to purchase new cards from the market. Strength, which is used to engage a bounty in physical combat. And clues, which are used to investigate a bounty. Now, the order you play your cards in is very important when playing mm -hmm. Cowboy Space Be uh, Bebop Space Serenade. As you fully resolve each card, one at a time when played, and other actions can be taken between playing cards. Now, players can spend fuel to move between the Bebop and the three planets. The cost to move to the Bebop is always one, but the cost to travel to a planet can change based on the card play and other in-game events. Purchasing cards can be done at any time during your team turn using any Wulong you have earned on the cards you have already played this turn. Now, each player has two unique abilities, one primary and one secondary, each which takes fuel to trigger. On your turn, you can use your own abilities or the primary abilities of any character in the same location with. Note this could be another player or a non-player character. Each of the four characters features totally different unique abilities. Now, Spike helps you cycle your deck and can buy cards from the market at a discount and place them on top of his deck. Ed can draw a card from their discard pile and lets everyone buy clues for fuel. When you are with Faye, you can convert fuel to Wulongs, and she can purchase cards from the market using fuel. Finally, Jet offers a way for players to remove wound cards from their hand and discard pile while being able to engage in physical combat with bounties without taking wounds himself. Now, the last action option is to confront a criminal on the same planet as your character. Spend strength to engage in physical combat or clues to investigate that criminal. With physical combat, you remove and keep one resistance token from the bounty card, but you also draw a wound card. When you spend clues, you keep a investigation token instead with no penalty. A criminal is captured the instant either of their two token piles is empty. The player who got the final shot in claims the bounty card, and then everyone earns one point per counter they have, returning them to the pool. Everyone moves back to the Bebop, and, move, and the movement gauge for that planet is reset to one. Now, after a capture, two new bounty cards are drawn from the Big Shot stand. If the planet showing on the new bounty is open, the card's placed there, and that's now the new criminal that's on that planet, and two new stacks of counters are put on top based on the numbers on the card. Now, if the card drawn shows a planet that already has an active bounty on it, the card is discarded and the movement gauge on the planet increases by one. Now, if any of these gauges ever gets past three, the criminal on that planet escapes. Their card is discarded and any tokens from that planet are returned to the pool with no one gaining points for them. The game continues like this, going around the table with players buying cards, moving between planets, investigating and battling criminals and claiming bounties, until the Vicious card is drawn from the Bounty deck. 
At this point, you enter the end game, where the game shifts to being a race to capture Vicious. The discarded bounty cards become a Vicious movement deck and, the, and an end game timer. Vicious tokens are stacked based on the player count, and note these are much higher than any of the other criminals you face so far. The game continues as before. Players take the same actions and can even continue to confront any remaining criminals in play. The only change is that a player on the same planet as Vicious can confront him. If you confront him physically, you will take two wound cards for every resistance token you claim. In addition, any turn that Vicious loses a resistance token, he may move to a new planet at the end of that turn. Now, using clues and taking investigation tokens also works on Vicious, though he does take three clues just to take one token. Now, unlike taking a resistance token, when you investigate him, he doesn't move. He doesn't know you're after him and stays put. If anyone ends up drawing the last card of the bounty deck, everyone gets one more turn, and at the end of that round, Vicious escapes, and everyone returns all of their Vicious tokens, scoring nothing for them. Now, the game continues until a player captures Vicious, with everyone scoring points for the token they collected, and the final blow getting his Vicious card, which is worth two points, or he escapes. Players then total up their points, which include points gained for collecting bounty tokens and any points on the bounty cards they collected. At that point, the player with the most points wins, with ties going to the player who collected the most individual bounty cards. Note, even if Vicious escapes, a winner is still declared, but that's a pretty lame victory and you should try again. Note, that's from the rulebook, not necessarily our suggestion. Now, these are the rules for playing with two or more players. The game also includes a solo mode. When playing solo, you complete, create the bounty deck as if you're playing a three-player game. Then while playing, any time you have to reshuffle your deck, which happens a lot, you reveal a new criminal card from the deck and discard it. This is in addition to drawing two cards when you claim a bounty in the normal way that the bounty's refreshed. The rest of the main game plays pretty much the same as with playing with more players. Once you reveal Vicious, you give him the capture tokens for four players and you build his movement deck out of any remaining cards on the Big Shot stand and all discarded cards. When playing solo, Vicious moves at the end of every turn, but you stop revealing cards whenever you shuffle your deck. Now, if Vicious escapes in this case, you lose. Otherwise, calculate your final score and there's even a spot in the rule book to note these scores down, what character you played and what your total was. All right, well, that's enough of an overview of play. For a more detailed gameplay description, check out Mo's written review on the blog. And let's move on to answering the question, who should pick up this game? All right, let me start by saying, uh, like full disclosure here, this was a review copy, which we already disclosed, but I'm a big fan of deck building card games. And I'm a big fan of Cowboy Bebop. So this had me jumping at a chance to review this one. So who is this? I'm like, oh, I want to try that. A Cowboy Bebop deck builder, I need to do it. What followed, though, after that were a number of pleasant surprises. Now, the first came when I was unboxing it, and you can actually watch it live, where I was just blown away by the quality of what you get in this box. Like dual layer player boards, miniatures, an awesome box insert that literally has a place for everything that fits perfectly and nothing shakes around. If you watch the video, I actually make the assumption that this must be a Kickstarter. This has got to be stretch goals that are in here. These are the kind of things that are usually stretch goals during a crowdfunding campaign. And to reinforce that hunch, the game includes cardboard standees in addition to the miniatures, which just seems really odd if it's not an upgrade. I honestly think there were plans to crowdfund this game and that these some of these things were upgrades and unlockables they expected to hit. But there's somewhere along the line, I don't know if it was at Japanime Games or what, they went, you know what, just publish it. Let's put it out there. This really does feel like a fully blinged out, deluxified, all-in pledge with all the pizzazz that comes in each copy. And yet you're not paying, you're, you're paying, you know, Kickstarter advanced copy prices. Uh, it's yeah. not the 70 or $80 retail version of a Kickstarter deluxe game. Uh, it's really shocking what you're getting in here. Uh, it, you know, it, it could easily just be a simple deck builder, Mm -hmm. but they've given you so much more that really does make a difference to play. Um, yeah. Even if you don't necessarily, you know, the, the difference between standees and miniatures arguably is, is very little in the way of gameplay. Mm -hmm. But other than that, all the other components really do enhance yes. the gameplay. Like even the box insert is meant to hold the tokens for you until you need them. Yeah. Like it's, it's a resource tray as well as a box insert. 
though I'll admit we still use my wooden bowls because I like my wooden bowls, but it does have a like a trough areas in there. Yep. Now the next surprise to me was the number of ways this game deviates from standard deck builders, the number of new elements and like just tweak things that were done a little bit different that are in this game. Uh, one of these is the wound deck. While I have played multiple deck building games going back to Dominion that have punitive cards, right? Cards that clog up your deck and they stink getting. I haven't played one where those cards are different. They're randomized, right? They come from a deck and have different effects. Like here, you're going to find wounds that go, when you get a wound, it's going to go on top of your deck. Another one will go in your discard. Another one goes, I don't know if there's one that goes in your hand, but like they play different things. And then the way you get rid of them is all different. Like some you have to pay Wulongs to get rid of. Other ones might take fuel. Some you don't even put in your deck at all. You just lose two fuel and discard it. And then there's there's another one that does nothing. Like if you're lucky, you can get the near miss card and not nothing. It was a near miss. You don't even take a wound. Yeah, this this was a real shocker. I mean, we're all used to clogging up our deck. Uh, but the fact that it's not a face up deck. Oh, take the wound and put the wound in mm -hmm. your, you know, it's the take cards. A, yeah, take take a, you know, take a card off that deck and figure out what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't, and it also affects how much you can plan ahead because if you're taking, doing an attack before you're done your turn, because this game is very important in what order things are done, mm -hmm. you may lose the ability to wrap up, to do your final actions. If all yes. of a sudden you pull a wound that wipes out the last of the fuel that you had planned on using later in your turn. Uh, Which so, is the end. Which is another aspect about that timing mechanism too, right? Like uh, your first game, you're going to mess this up. Probably your fourth game, you might mess it up. And eventually you learn, you're like, wait, I got to time this. So the last thing I do on my turn is the physical attack because I'm going to take those wounds and I need to account for that because I had those turns where you're like, I'm going to fly here, do this thing, and I'm going to hit him. Then I'm going to fly over here and hit this and get two bounties this turn. Meanwhile, you hit the first guy, you lose all your fuel. Now, another welcome addition is the ability to spend resources to clear the marketplace. This is something I would love to see in more deck builders. Any player on their turn can spend two fuel between their actions to wipe the market. In addition to this, there's also a number of bounty cards that cause you to wipe the market as soon as they enter play. Now, one of the things to remember about this game is to watch for that. This is the most easy thing to miss while playing this game is you flip up a bounty that should have wiped the market and you missed it. So watch for that. This is fantastic, though, because it eliminates a common deck building problem for non-static markets where the market fills up with either cards no one can afford or cards no one wants. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. And it is an issue that the the detail on the on the new bounty card that tells you to wipe the deck is uh, it's not small, but it kind of feels it fits in with the card and it's easy to to sort of not pay attention yeah. to. Um, but yeah, and, and not only does it solve the problems that exist with static markets or, you know, that are, are not static market markets, but flexible markets that get clogged up, but it also forces you to worry about, again, mm -hmm. about turn order because you might be wanting to buy something, but if you kill somebody before you buy, there's a chance that when the, if a new guy comes out, it might wipe the deck and you might not yep. be able to buy that card that you've been planning since last turn to pick up. Uh, next, I have the combo system. Well, combo systems aren't new thing to deck building. Like I remember them first from Star Realm. Star Realm was the first to do it really well, where if you play a card of the same color, it keys off and it does extra stuff. But I like the way it's done here and the way it's tied into the theme. So all of the combos here require you to have cards from two different characters who are then thematically working together to produce the new effect. And you almost get a little bit of a story there. You're like, well, I'm going to get some th some some Wulongs, but if I bring Faye with me, I also get some fuel, right? Like there's a bit of that going on. And I just like that aspect of the game, which makes it feel like the Bebop team working together without the players physically working together. And on top of that, you get into some hilarious struggles, again, because of your turn order. If mm -hmm. you've got a blue card that... Uh, combos with a red card and the but the red card also combos with the blue card you have to decide you have to pick which yep. order you, you're only going to get one of them you only uh you can't back you know can't backwards combo so you really need to focus and decide what order things are going to go mm -hmm. in and you're going to lose one of the combos out of it if you don't have enough cards to to make it happen uh and you really have to again thinking about that play order within your own turn. 
And this is something that, that people who have played a lot of deck builders struggle with. We are so used to playing our entire card hand down on the table to figure out what we got. That does not work in this game. You got to play them one at a time. And if you got to move planets between cards, you got to wait till you move. And there's even timing with that where you're like, well, I have a card that does a fuel and, and, and gives me a strength so I can attack. Well, you can't use that fuel to move to the planet to do the attack because you have to resolve the whole card. You don't get to move until you're done. This whole thematic element of reluctant cooperation between competing bounty hunters leads me to my favorite part of this game. And this is the whole thing with you're all playing different characters and you have miniatures, but you can move each other around. It tends to be Jet Black's cards that let you move players around. And you have cards that are like move a non-player character, move a player character, move multiple characters. And then once you move them around, it's that ability to use other players' special abilities. And again, it's players or non-player characters. So even if you're playing solo, all four of the characters are in play. And you're going to try to use your deck to manipulate those characters so they're there when you need it. And while the thing is, the players playing those characters and their players may not want to help. You might be over about to take out Vicious and then another player then flies you over to their planet so they can use your ability to, you know, heal some cards. And you're like, but now I don't have enough fuel to get back. That's the kind of thing that happens in this game. And I've got to say, if you watch the anime, these are reluctant f cooperators. They, 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 they are all bounty hunters, each trying to get the bounty themselves. And yeah, they got to work together to do a few things, but they would much rather be the ones to climb the final glory. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's another one of those things where you need to pay attention because it's real easy to be staring down at your hand, trying to work out that turn order that's so important and miss the fact that someone has just picked you up off one planet and put you onto another planet, which has completely destroyed the turn you'd been building in your hand. Yep. Now, I also like the fact there's a twist at the end of this game. Like, there's something else. Like, there's a finale. There's a boss fight, I guess, is really what it is. I like the fact that it switches to focusing on capturing Vicious. And you actually feel the shift in the game. At that point, things feel more desperate. You feel like you don't have enough time. You're not going to get it done. You feel like you're in a race. But mechanically, the game actually stays the same. So the actual gameplay doesn't change, but just like the feeling around the table shifts. Yeah, because you know at least after a play or two that you can't just take pot shots at him and hope he'll hope to beat him. You have to determinedly attack or investigate him or he will leave and no one will get those bonus points. Yes. And honestly, there's the opposite strategy. If you know everyone else has a whole bunch of points on vicious, you want him to run away as quick as possible. So no one gets those points. Now, another really th brilliant thing in this game is having a resource you can save. I have never played a deck builder where I have a resource I can carry over turn to turn. I love that. Another one is the fact that you have two ways to confront each criminal. Again, very thematic. You can go into physical combat or you can investigate them. And I even dig the fuel system for moving around the board and how, you know, I, I don't know what it's supposed to represent, but like this person becomes harder to find on the planet. So it takes more fuel to find them. They're going into hiding, you know, like there's little thematic things there. I dig those elements as well. Yeah, this game is really well thought through, not only from a pure deck builder, you know, uh, concept with just the mechanics. If you, if you take all the layers of paint off, it plays really well, but then add to it the fact that it is thematic. It really yep. does tell the story of Cowboy Bebop quite well. Yes. Now, my biggest surprise out of everything is why do I not hear anyone else saying these things? Why is no one talking about this game? Like, it seems like it completely slipped under the radar, which is a shame. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is one of the best deck building games I've ever played. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's there's no excuse for this game not being shouted about. Uh, and the only thing we can think of that sort of came up is that it may have been overshadowed by Dune and Arnak. But, yeah, but those came out a year later. Yeah, I thought I, that and then I looked into it. and I'm like, no, this came out 2019. Dune and Lost Ruins of Arnak are 2020. So I will admit that was all pandemic time. That was all COVID time. That was all lockdown. So it is possible that it got overlooked. Well, it also depends on, you know, where it got released. Did it get released That's true. and buried at this con that, you know, this game decided to take off on? And mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of little things 
that go into game release schedules that uh, apparently left this one in the dust. I think one of the problems is when you look at it, it looks like another deck builder. You don't know that you're getting miniatures and double layer player boards and deluxe components by looking at the cover of the box. Like the back, you might see it. You don't know that there's four resources and one carries over, which has never been done before. You don't know that the punitive deck is randomized so that there's different effects for every player every time you hit. Well, it's not every time. There's repeats in it. Like, you don't know these things that deviate from the norm. And it's licensed, and people still have a bias against licensed games, which I think is justified being someone who grew grew up in the 80s. But people have that, and I personally think nowadays you need to toss that out because there's tons of great licensed games. But I think all of that is what really hurt this game is people didn't know to look deeper. They're like, oh, it's Spammy Games, another deck builder, probably plays like Tonto Kore, and it's Cowboy Biba. And that's not what this is. Now, it's also worth noting, you don't have to be a Bebop fan to enjoy this game. We've proven this. We played this game now many times with our friends, Kat and Tori, who only know Cowboy Bebop as an anime, like they know the name. They didn't even know it was about, excuse me, they didn't even know it was about space bounty hunters. They just knew that people seemed to, excuse me. I don't know what just happened. I'm falling apart there. Try that one again. Where I have Sauron. I I, I got to the bottom of my car. I don't know. But it's also worth noting, you don't have to be a Bebop fan to enjoy this game. We played this game many times with their friends, Kat and Tori. And when they only know Cowboy Bebop by name, they know it's a classic anime. They didn't even know it was a show about bounty hunters in space. They had no clue what the actual premise of the show was. They just knew it was a classic anime and people dig the soundtrack. Yeah, it's unfortunate that there isn't a uh, a good jazz listening uh, list that can, you know as well. <laughs> a little QR code in the rule book to there you Spotify go. your jazz li- jazz listening. Uh... I, I will admit, you can find the Cowboy Bebop series soundtrack on Spotify, which is what we used the last time we played. So you, you got to say, when watching it, you don't realize how many slow, mellow, kind of honky tonky songs are in that until you sit down and play it while you're playing the game. You're like, no, no, give me the the upbeat songs. Now, if I had to find faults with this game, because I, I, I hate being all this positive, like there's got to be something wrong, right? Well, I'll start with building the bounty deck. Doing that during setup stinks. Like like having to pull out all the zero point bounties, then sort them by planet, then randomize them. And you're randomizing two cards. Randomize the two cards, then put one of those on each of the planets. Then you got to take these cards and put them with the rest of the decks, but still split by planet. Then you shuffle those, and then you take out some cards based on how many players there are, and until you memorize it, that means looking up in the rule book and go, okay, wait a minute, it's three players. How many cards do we have to leave in? Okay, we got to leave four cards in, so I deal four cards. And then you've got the ones that are left. You put some in the box, and then you shuffle all those together. And then even then, you got to take three cards off the bottom and shuffle in the vicious card and shuffle that together and put it there. All I can say is you get better at this the more games you play. And I found it once I realized how many cards there were and started doing it by I need to remove X cards, it became a lot easier. Like, I'll give you the secret right now. With four players, you remove one plan, one card. With three players, you remove two. And with two players, you remove three. Once you get that down, it's way easier than having to look up in the book, and go, okay, I have to keep four. Well, it's easier to remove two than to keep four type of thing. Yeah, and the only other thing I would say specifically regarding that deck is the two-player game length could be a little short for some people. Uh, yeah. I, I find the three player game length of this game is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and four players, four players fine. Uh, there can be, it can go a little bit longer than the box says we noticed, yeah. but it doesn't really feel long. Uh, three sure. player is fantastic. Two player plays a little bit short because of the way you're, you're crafting down the deck. And I would say actually the three player, I think is the sweet spot for gameplay as well, just because of that non-player character mechanic. And the fact there are cards that do things with non-player characters. The four players, there are no non-player characters. So that actually really devalues those cards. They just generate you Wulongs now. And that ability to move the non-player character, I think, is a good advantage. I would say this is best at three, but there's no problem at four. And two, like two, it played great. It was nice and quick. It was still enjoyable. Um, Did you get a chance to try it solo? I didn't, no. No. So I will admit, I didn't try it solo. One of the things that turned me off the solo mode was it's just to beat your high score. Like there were no ranks to achieve. There was that I, at least if you're going to make me beat my whole own score, give me a target so that I can fail it the first couple of times and be like, right. I need to get the 40 to do well. I'm like, I don't wouldn't even know what a good score is in the game playing solo. So I will admit we did not try it solo. 
to me i i'm not a big fan of next you know just get a higher score i would like yeah. a win or loss condition when it comes to solo play now another thing i would have liked to have seen in this game is a symmetry in the initial player decks when you first get this game and start playing it looks like you have unique decks but honestly what it is is you have four cards in your player color which matters because those will combo off different cards later in the game but those four cards are identical between all four players for what they do yeah this is it, i mean it's again it's nice. we're, you get a, you the, because of the combo it's it, it's slightly asymmetrical but not really yeah. Now, you do have unique player abilities. It's totally asymmetric. So, like, I'm just, you know, I love asymmetry. If I can squeeze more in there. Just one card. Give me one card that fits the play style. Give, give, give Spike a draw card. Give, um, give uh, Ed a way to generate clue. Give Faye a way to generate extra fuel. Like, just, just something. Give, um, give, uh, what's a Jet Black a, a remove a wound card in his deck instead of a special bit. Like, just do that. Just one card out of all of them. Heck, give you 11 cards at the start, so you don't have that. I, there's another minor complaint that's a complaint about almost every deck builder ever made. I hate the 10-card starting deck where you draw five, because you know what your first two hands are. I don't like that. I want, I want like, knowing, uh, give me well, one more card. You know what? At the same time, though, you know, but you don't know. I mean, you there are plenty no, of times. Once you've drawn your sudden, first five. Yes, but there's a lot of times where it's like you, you draw that first five, and it's like, oh, look. I'm spending on my first turn and I've got nothing to spend on my second turn. Yes. Um, it, it's the, the predetermined second hand that bothers me. Not that, not that initial five. It's the, I know what the next five are. Right. Once I've learned the cards in the deck, which honestly isn't hard when six of them are the same. <laughs> All right. Overall cowboy bebop space serenade is a fantastic deck builder. Uh, it's honestly one of the best we've ever played. And that's coming from a group, Sean included, and the usual players I play with that love deck building mechanics and games that use them. I truly do not understand why more people aren't like like hyping this game. There's just so much here we enjoyed, and it actually took some thinking to come up with things to complain about here. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you enjoy Cowboy Bebop and play hobby board games, you need to pick this game up. Yeah. If you play and enjoy deck building games, you need to pick this game up. If you're like us and enjoy both, this should be a no-brainer. No, I agree. Unless you totally hate Cowboy Bebops or hate deck building, I know there are deck building haters out there, you really should find a way to at least try this game out. Find out if the local game store has a, a demo copy, find a friend who's got a copy, see if there's a, a demo night or a local cafe you can play it. I can't think of many hobby board game groups that aren't going to find something to enjoy here. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a true hidden gem that just hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. And I hope this review helps more people discover this great game. And I hope people pick it up. And I hope Japan and game sees that. And I don't know, we get some kind of more content. I don't know what that's going to be. Like, we've got the main characters already. I don't know quite what you can do here, but I would love to see this game thrive. See ya, Space Cowboy. Well, that's it for our review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, a deck builder where whatever happens, happens. Is there a licensed game out there that you love? Let us know about it in the comments. Now, before we go, I also invite you to check out my written review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com. If you're listening to this on the podcast, it better be up there or else I'm slacking. Uh, this will feature pictures of this well-produced anime game and a more detailed description of play. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So despite not recording here from quite some time, I don't have a lot to talk about here tonight. We were busy, like really busy. Sean was moving to Windsor. Deanna and I had holiday deals and well, other not fun non-gaming stuff that's just not worth getting into right now. Now, thankfully, we're back on track to get some games to the table moving forwards, mm -hmm. even though things haven't fully settled down and the sales will continue right up until the new year, likely. Likely. I, there doesn't tend to be New Year's sales. Like the, the, what it, Boxing Day in Canada tends to be after that. We can relax a little bit. So jumping back to the end of October, I finally got to try Marvel Champions. The the latest, well, I don't know if it's latest, maybe they put out one since, but it, but a big living card game from Fantasy Flight Games. Um, I will admit I have tried many of Fantasy Flight's living card games. 
even Star Wars, and they just never do it for me, but I may have found one I like. I broke this out at the Sandwich Brewery, and first off, this is not a brewery game. <laughs> this is not a game to learn in a brewery. Um, For one, it's just not an easy-to-learn game, and it's got your Fantasy Flight 2 books, and you're referencing all these books. And second, there's just lots of little chits and bits and Hobbit-sized cards. Um, And this part totally baffles me. It has a box insert that is a slots for cards without any dividers, so everything just sits loose in the plastic tray. And it's really odd because I guess this is the first living card game to come with a box insert, but doesn't have the dividers to actually separate the cards. So I I don't even know what's I, happening I, there. I, maybe maybe they're 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 baby steps. You know they've got the insert next game. N- next week the, the, the next game has dividers. <laughs> I don't know. Like like I whatever. I I am again. I I will admit I have not kept up or played many of the living card games. Uh so Marvel Champions, you pick a hero. You then pick like what type of hero and and I'm going to totally like I played once. Right. Um, So so I can't say a lot to this, but you're picking a hero and then you're picking like a type. So you pick like Iron Man and Justice and you pair those two decks up and then you pick a villain to play and the box comes with a bunch. The game we played, we picked Rhino and then you pick the scheme Rhino's trying to do. And we did Rhino's trying to break break into a a bank bank vault. Um, And then there's a bunch of these other like side story things that are happening. And we used um, the bomb threat. And then you make decks out all these things. Then it plays like every superhero card game I've ever played, where like the heroes get a turn, then the villain does something. And what the villain does is dictated by flipping cards. Um, Except there's a whole system here where your character can be in like their heroic battle, the bad guy form, or they can be in their their alternate form, which like for Spider-Man is his alter ego uh, for Captain Marvel, I think it was just Car- Carol Danvers, but like, um, I think for some characters that are always powered, it's different. Like Hulk is obviously like Bruce Banner and the Hulk. Um, and it's neat because when you're human, I'm mean, human's probably the bad word. When when you're non heroic, the villain gets to scheme, and that's how they win. If the villain completes their scheme, they win. And while when you're not battling them, they're free to just work on their schemes, right? But when you're not heroic, it also means you're not being attacked and you can heal. And then when you are challenging them, then you fight. And there's a whole combat system with taking wounds and everything. And there's allies and everything. But I really loved the switch back and forth, especially with the team. Like, you know what? If we, you let them scheme this turn, I'll be able to hit them to do this thing. And then you get the side schemes, like the bomb threat comes out. And if you don't stop it within so many turns, bad things happen. A whole bunch going on. And I got to say, like, I, I've been hearing really good things about this that it's one of the best living card games ever produced, and I'm now believing the hype. Now, at this point, all I played is, like, the starter adventure with the starter decks, and I was really impressed. And it looks like the customization in this game is a little lower than, like, say, Magic or other living card games. It's more like pick a hero, pick a deck, and mash them. But I guess there's ways to modify those decks as well. I don't know if I'll ever get into that part of the game, but what I've been hearing about the expansion packs, like, if you play Iron Man, it's all about having to get bits of gear into play. And you start off pretty useless, but the more bits of gear you get into play, the better you are. And he's like terrible getting beat up to now he's kicking butt because he's got his full suit on. And I'm like, oh, super thematic. And I guess other characters are similarly thematic that way. So what uh, if you had to compare it to something else, what would you compare it to? It's closest to Sentinels of the Multiverse with, with that whole. So what happens on the villain turn? is they either scheme or or uh, or attack you. But then you get this hazard deck, and every player in the game gets a hazard card, and you flip them. That part very much feels like Sentinels of the Multiverse, where, where you know you read down the villain card, and then you flip the card and do the thing. What's missing here is that other deck of environmental things going on. But like that's kind of mixed in with the hazard deck, because a hazard deck is like allies that'll show up, And like by playing Spider-Man, you actually put like a vulture card in that deck so that like part of the game can be like side plot happens. Like there's a lot of interaction. This is why I'm like not a good game to learn at a pub, uh, a a brewery, because there's just all these interesting interactions and cards going on. And the one thing is like if if I get into it, I'm going to need to figure out how people sort their cards. I'm like, I am clueless as to like, except for here's the starter deck. Here's the starter deck. Here's Rhino. For the future, when I've now played 10 times and Sean's going to come over and we're like, all right, what heroes do you want to play and who do we want to fight? I have no clue how to sort this so I can quickly build those decks to play. Right. 
Though I think that's just a learning curve on Marvel champions. Right. Uh, is, it, say, is it MCU or comic? Comic book. Comic book? <laughs> <laughs> I think. All right. I think it's Sorry, comic I shouldn't book. have put you on the spot there. Yeah, I, I again, we, we played yep. once. Yep. It felt comic book to me. Spider-Man in particular, like Spider-Man was very much Peter Parker with adult obligations. Right. Um, I don't know. D played D agrees, Captain Marvel. D agrees yeah. comic book. Yeah. D, D played Captain Marvel. And well, I don't know anything about Captain Marvel from the comics. <laughs> the Captain Marvel I read had a very large fro and it was a very different character than Carol Danvers. There you go. I don't even remember what her name was anymore, but the original Captain Marvel. All right. So what about November? All right. So again, I mentioned this earlier, two games. That's it. We got in two games. That shows how rough November has been. I don't remember the last time when I only got in two games. Like, I think since I've been rogging my plays on Board Game Geek, I've never had a month with two games. But anyway, there were two games. First up was Smash Up Disney. Um, I can't remember if I talked about this before because it's been long enough or if that was like my first play of Smash Up Disney. I don't think so. Maybe it was. I don't even know. Um, but it wasn't what I expected. I honestly thought when uh, this is a review copy came from a uh, not AG, sorry, the op. This is a joint collaboration between the op and AG. We got a copy from the op who we've worked with many times. Op is op is one of the best people to work with. Um, so I got it and I was totally expecting Smash Up Light. I was expecting Smash Up for Kids. I was expecting my first Smash Up. I don't know. Something that would be Smash Up, but simple to learn, easier to play, quicker to set up mash up two Disney movies and go. And that's not what it is. It is a new expansion for Smash Up with all the complexity, difficulty, reading, memorization, and learning curve of every other Smash Up expansion that came before it. Now, there is one nice new feature, and that is the base cards, the actual yes. location cards, which do make things a little easier. Uh, although apparently some Smash Up aficionados... Don't Just like them. Don't like them because they 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 <laughs> they prevent the ability to hide what you're doing and and you know let people not pay attention to what the score is. But as a first time Smash Up player, I thought they were fantastic. Yep. Uh, players of um, Marvel Smash, uh, Snap, Snap, sorry, Marvel Snap will feel some familiarity with what's mm -hmm. going on. Uh, it's not the same. But there is some sort of consistency and, and you can understand where the, uh, the game play if you've played Marvel Snap a little bit easier. But as Mo said, the memorization and the reading of this game yeah. is is intense. Uh, this is not something that if you are not, you know, some uh, Red Meeple Ryan would have trouble with this game because there is a lot of reading yes. and memorization. And, you know, even if you've got all the cards memorized from three decks, there are eight decks that could be mashed up. And, in this you know, game, yeah. So, in this particular set, you have eight different decks that can be mashed together in every possible combination. Right. And so that's a lot of cards to, to yeah. memorize as well as try and figure out how they interact with the various locations. Yeah, the hardest part is there are cards that affect other parts of the game, right? So there's a base... It doesn't just matter when you're at that base or focused on it, right? Like it'll have a base effect, which is like move any of your characters here. Well, so you're playing off on this corner and battling for this base. You can, you have to remember, oh yeah, I could just send my person over here. So, you know, you're battling your butt off over here, but then you realize you're outranked. There's no way you're going to win. You're going to come in fourth. Your best bet is to move that character. But then you have to remember that there's a base over here where you can move your character to. And then like every time anything happens in the game, when you're learning it, especially with new decks, it feels like you have to stop and read everything that's in play again, just to see. And even when you play a new character, it's like, put a power-up token. Wait, wait, don't I have a guy that every time I place a power-up token, I double them? Oh, wait, he's over here. Oh, he's over here. Okay, we're good. Oh, no, wait, because you put that base modifier that cancels his ability, so that actually doesn't happen. Okay, good, I'm done. Like, that's the kind of stuff that happens yeah. in this game. And unlike unlike Marvel Snap, it's not just all right there in front of you. You know, everyone's got the same view where it's easy. No, this is, you know, there's a bunch of locations, out, four locations on the table, and if you've got four players, you're all looking at five it. Five locations. Uh, five locations, and you're all looking at it at different angles and trying to, to read uh, we haven't yet, but I suggested last time, you know, we should throw this on the Lazy Susan so that yep. you can rotate it around when it's your turn and double check to make sure you're not missing something over on that far corner that mm -hmm. is a little harder to see and read. 
And that's not even taking into account learning to play the decks and how they work together. And, oh, this one lets me go through my graveyard. And no, this one, oh, I'm saying graveyard. There's my magic background coming in. I don't discard pile. This one lets me bring cards out of my discard pile, which will combo good with this one that every card you pull out of your discard does that. Like the whole smash up thing, right? Like that's what smash up is. And at this point, we played three or four. I don't even remember. Well, we, we played a handful of times with not enough yet to do a full review, but one will be coming. This is this is on the list. It's one I plan on playing more. Uh, unfortunately, I think I will not be able to play this one with one of my daughters. I, they, I think it'll be just too much for her. Um, she, she has some learning abil- disabilities and, and there's just going to be way too much going on. And honestly, I'm scared to play with my other daughter because she has terrible AP and spends like every turn trying to maximize her one action and it just with all those cards in play like you're just the decision trees explodes every time you put one more card down i'm concerned about playing with her that it's going to be a five hour game of smash ups now to be fair there is one aspect of the game that i think does help uh and i i don't know if this is special to the disney i haven't played any of the others but they each of the decks does come with a card that gives you an idea about how mm-hmm. that deck is used some ideas you know some some concepts of that deck to give you a, a nudge in the right direction. Uh, but it, that's all it is. It really is just a nudge. So it yeah. might be really helpful for an experienced smash up player, but is, is really just kind of a, a hint that you try to remember otherwise. Now, one big disadvantage I will say for smash up fans, adding this to their collection is they change the terminology, which I get it. Cause it's Disney and you want to have heroes but every other smash up calls them minions. So there has to be a rule in this game that every hero counts as a minion and every minion counts as a hero. And I'm just like, that's annoying. Like, again, if you were going to do kind of a standalone, my first smash up, I don't mind hero because you're teaching people a new game. But when this is just a full smash up expansion, that's also a standalone new intro box. That's just annoying. And it's going to confuse people even more. Yeah. And if anyone thinks Oh, we're overblowing it. This is, it must be easier. No, no. You have to look at the rule book that has like 15 pages of card combination possibilities and rule clarifications because this has to work with all all the other smash up games. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all was expecting. I'm not even saying this is bad. It's fantastic for those of you who (laughs) love smash up. If you love smash up eight new decks, here you go. I, I have to say, I liked it. I mean, I've only played the ones so far. But I enjoyed it, again, partially because I was coming from having just jumped in and, and gotten full bore on Marvel Snap. And, and that connection. This is like the meaty version of was Snap. Feel, yeah, I was feeling that, oh, OK, now I get to do all this. Yeah. So I, I was really digging it. But that's now I went the easy. opposite way where I played Smash Up. Then I played Sma- Snap. And this is going to sound a bit harsh, but I'm like, it's Smash Up, but good. Because <laughs> you only play six rounds and you're you're limited to a deck of only 10 cards that you can really customize and i like that better though i will admit i got sick of snap pretty quickly i don't play it anymore but like at first when i was playing snap i was just like oh this is what smash up should be (laughs) because oh the first game playing like tori and cat sorry cat had played smash up many times tori had never played i played with the original set maybe there was an expansion in there like it had been, I don't know, how long has the game been out? 10, 20 yeah, years? It's like now? a decade. Yeah, it's at least 10 years. I think the anniversary edition's coming out this year or did come out. So, like, it had been 10 years. And I'm like, man, I am overwhelmed. Like, I play heavy game. I play Vitalis Herta games. And here I am overwhelmed by a Disney game because <laughs> there's just too much going on. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, every time I think I know what to do, I realize that I need to know what my opponents can do to really make my decision. So, not only do I need to know my deck, I need to know their deck. And I'm just like, wow. This is a lifestyle game. Yeah, no, this is. And again, we keep saying it's a Disney game. And yes, it has the Disney brand. But what comes with that brand is an expectation, a childish sort of feeling. And you do not get that with this game. Like maybe we need to stop thinking that Mm because because Disney sidekicks was very much the same thing. That is an extremely difficult action management game that is not at all for kids, despite what it looks like. But then Funko puts out 
Jack and the Beanstalk and the, the Thunder Mountain and the roller coaster. And those are all light games. So I don't yeah. even know what to think with the Disney license. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really hit or miss at the moment. <laughs> they are, they do seem to be not diluting their brand. I mean, how can you dilute Disney? They're already everywhere, but you can, you know, adding some brand confusion in as to whether or not this is for kids or not. Uh, you almost need a Disney yes. kids brand branding yeah. logo to, to help uh, parents decide whether or not they should yeah. get, Oh, this fun thing with Elsa on the cover that my daughter loves frozen. My mm -hmm. daughter's head just exploded trying to figure out this <laughs> game. Yep. Um, All right. The only other game I played in November was cowboy bebop space serenade. Um, I, we just reviewed it. There's, there's really not more to, to say about this. Um, my biggest concern about the game, which I didn't bring up in the review because I didn't think it really fit because we haven't proven it yet is I was worried it was going to start to feel the same because it should. Like if I sit there and think about what I'm doing every game, I'm collecting the same four resources. I'm going to the same planets. I'm capturing the same, um, bounties. And here's, here's a knock against the game. I probably could have included in the review doesn't really feel different like the people you're hunting like you don't feel it oh i'm going after teddy bomber like they don't have any special abilities it's just how high their stacks of tokens are and what they cost to get them and most are two clues to get an investigation and one strength to get a physical confrontation there's very little deviation there i kind of would have liked a little more like teddy bomber you can't do this or um the foo you must discard a card when attacking them and I get it. it would add to the complexity level of the game. But even without that, even with the fact that really except up till vicious, everyone kind of feels the same. And Sean was even complaining about LeFou being one of the toughest ones to beat. It's only worth one point. And why is this other person worth two? Like it just didn't seem to have a logical pro progression. And I'm like, it's going to feel the same. I'm going to hunt bounties. I'm going to buy cards from the deck. Now, a big part of that is how thick that market deck is. It's huge. You will not go through it in a single gameplay. And honestly, we played five times. I don't even know if we've seen every card in that deck. They may not be cards that just never came up randomly. Or 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 have been grabbed fast enough that you didn't notice them. It there's yeah, there's definitely cards yeah. I've not bought. The market, the market deck is huge. And you know, Mo, Mo was saying that he keeps expecting this, but the fact is we played back to back games last night and we yes. aren't feeling it. No, we're expecting that we should get to that point, but it's not coming. Yet. No, it hasn't happened. Like, like I, I just expect them to be like, yeah, yeah, Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, I got my 10 cards. I buy some cards. I go to a planet. Yeah, I hit them twice. Oh, now I played enough games. I realized I should investigate a couple times first to get some extra tokens before I take them out. Oh, how thematic. That's really cool. But I figured that out. Like, I don't, I don't think there's a hidden strategy I haven't discovered yet. And that's, we're still playing it that way. And our scores are close. Mm -hmm. Our last game was 16 to 17 to 18. Yep. Like one point away each. I don't know. I, 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 it's not I, like I didn't even mention it in the review because it hasn't happened. Yeah. And no. I got to say, nowadays, if you can play five games of a game, including two right in a row and not feel sick of it, that's all most groups need. Despite yeah. what most people think that they want to play their games hundreds of times, most people don't. So if you can play a game five times with a couple games in a row on the same night, that's a pretty strong recommendation for it not feeling too samey. And that means you're looking at. Ten bucks a play for a game with a vacuum form insert, uh, you know, the double layer player insert, boards, double layer player boards, miniatures. Yeah. Again, the value for this game just keeps getting better. Yeah, I, I'm so not sick of it. Deanna has admitted she's like, I can't see recommending it. Like, if we we're like, oh, what do you want to play out of all the games we own? She's probably not going to pick it. And I'm like, I think I would if I was in the right mood. If I'm, I'm looking like, for ah, a deck builder. Yeah, you know, let's let's play like Bebop. I'm gonna say let's play Dominion tonight. I'm gonna yeah. say let's play Bebop. No, I, I you more so. You like deck builders more than we do. But like out of the deck builders, I own like I I'll admit I'd rather play Core Worlds. But Core Worlds is a three to four hour. That's a epic. slog. <laughs> I love that game, but it is a very different game than playing Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, but yeah, over Dominion, Clank. I think I'd probably rather play Bebop over Clank right now. That's weird. Anyway, that's it for November. Now, so far in December, I think this is hilarious. We've already played twice as many games as last month. So that's a trend I hope keeps going up. We'll try to do it exponential. To, you know, three more days in, we'll be at, we'll be at uh, whatever the next double is. 
we're at two times and then we go to whatever, four times, and then we go to eight times. And then we hear, you know, we'll keep expanding it up 30. We'll go to 1028 times more <laughs> game plays than last year, last month. Um, now two of those plays were Cowboy Bebop. I played twice in a row. We played two player and three player to see how much of an impact it had. I don't think I need to talk about Cowboy Bebop anymore, unless you have anything else to add. Nope. I think we covered that pretty thoroughly. There you go. Um, but the other one we did play is Chapter One of Black Brim 1876. This is a game that if you are a normal like board gamer, hobby gamer, hanging out on Board Game Geek, you may not have heard of. But if you are into escape room style games and escape mail and mystery style games and get a package to your house and have to solve something, you may have heard of Puzzling Pursuits is the company that puts these out. Now, the one thing that I actually think I, I had to change the title of our YouTube unboxing is I thought this was a mystery. Yes, technically, there is a mystery, but this is not a mystery solving game. This, you are not trying to solve the case. This is not like a cold case file or anything like that. Yes, you are in Black Brim in 1876 and all the police are missing. You're just trying to locate them. Um, is it's it, it's been 100% family friendly because of this. These aren't murdered police people. They're just missing. And they were taken by basically the 1876 version of the Riddler. Someone who likes puzzles, who left clues for the lead inspector to find the police. I kind of feel like I'm playing Batman 70 or 66 while I'm playing this game. Like it, I know it's set in 1876, but you just kind of get that detective feel. But it's not a mystery. This is puzzles. So we played five of us, the kids, Deanna's mom, me and Deanna on Sunday. Um, they say one to two hours. I think we're around hour 10, maybe hour and a half. And that's with like pausing so Deanna could take pictures and stuff. What I loved about this, what was fantastic is there were five separate puzzles in part one, totally unrelated to each other, standalone puzzles where the solution to each of these puzzles is combined to unlock chapter two which let the five of us all play at once doing our own thing. So we started off and we divvied it up. And I'm not going to consider these spoilers because you can see the pictures on Puzzling Pursuits and they use them in all the promotions. And they say the stuff you see in the box isn't going to spoil anything because, again, there's not really a story here. It's puzzles. Like, yes, you could take the pictures and zoom in on them and solve the puzzle without buying the game, I guess. But like, the, I'm not going to give it anyway. So it's like, all right, who wants to take the newspaper clippings? Okay, who wants to take the postcards? Okay, who wants to take the cipher? Who wants to take this? Who wants to take that? And we all divvied them up and everyone started solving. And some of us got them right away, but like organically, it was just like, oh, let me help you with that. Or, you know what? I'm not figuring anything else. Do you want to swap? And we went around and we slowly solved the puzzles until we were down to just one. And then it was all five of us trying to solve this one puzzle. And it was just difficult enough that like we got a little frustrated. Like it took all five of us and we eventually figured it out. Some of the other puzzles, yeah, it was like like instant. Like it was literally, you look at it, you're like, oh, that's what they want you to do. And then there was very much the case of, here is my daughter staring at a menu for forever, making lots of notes, writing things down, hands it off to someone else, they read it and go, well, I think you're supposed to do this. And that's where the multiple players really helped, like having multiple brains on it. Yeah. But it avoided the unlock, exit the game. Here, let me try. Can I hold that? I didn't get to see the picture yet. Can I read the card next? And I love the fact we all got to play it once. Yeah, and the fact that the, the puzzles were different enough, that the different point of view and just coming at it with yeah. a fresh, open set of eyes made a difference mm -hmm. is fantastic. That's what you want. And honestly, that's what you get in an escape room right yes. you know someone's staring at something hanging on a wall for 10 minutes and then you know bob walks over and goes oh, oh. <laughs> and and somebody probably is cursing at that point but yeah. still that's you know that's how the game goes yeah the other thing um that i didn't like so this isn't app driven but it uses a web page now what you do is you have to go to the web page and here's a brilliant thing i've never seen a game recommend before that says check your answers so you go, I did the newspaper puzzle. This is my, it, and then you go, are you looking for clues or are you looking for to check your answer? And you're like, I'm looking to check my answer. Like, okay, what's the answer? And it gave me a drop down that didn't spoil anything. And I'm like this, and like, you have managed to find blah, blah, blah. Good job. Once it was bad. Like we were like, no, you're, you seem to be on the right track, but you're missing something. 
no timer, no penalties for this. No, oh, you suck. Just, oh, but verify your answer. So you're not then trying to solve the meta game answer at the end with some wrong information. So by the time we were solving it, and I will admit part of what let us solve that fifth puzzle was having the other one solved. So there was a bit of deduction used for that last puzzle. We're like, well, it can't be this because of these other puzzles. So there was a little bit of interacting. Now, the one thing I don't like, it's British. You have to know certain things about Britain to be able to solve the puzzle in this, like how their currency works. Second, the postcards, unless you know Britain really well, you're going to have to use Google Lens, which is what I did because. I guessed one of them, and I was right, but there are postcards of historic places that exist, and I don't know what these places are. <laughs> um, no, it does warn you on the box that you you the, the game does not necessarily contain everything you need to solve the puzzles. Right. So you might need to do some Googling, which is only a problem because the game's called Black Brim 1876. So I guess the, the, the meta would be if you were in 1876, you'd know what these places are. And if you're in 1876, you'd understand the currency system. <laughs> so I guess there's that. But it did kind of take you out of it a bit. But again, this wasn't a murder mystery. It didn't have the immersion that a murder mystery does where you're solving a case. These were puzzles. The company's called Puzzling Pursuits. It fits. Yep. So we only play chapter one. Chapter two, hopefully, will be this Sunday. And then we'll have a full review by next Wednesday. There we go. All right. Finally, we do have another game the belgian beers race <laughs> because i always forget the s i also want to call it the great belgian i want to call it the great belgian beer race i don't know why like is there something else that's the great something race that that like i say often that mm. I, I i want to mash those two together <laughs> i don't know but the belgian beers race which uh i don't have in front of me who it's a collaboration by it's a collaboration from Grand Gamers Guild and someone else, I apologize for not it's knowing. Actually, who. I believe three different companies. Three. Wow. Okay. So it was kickstarted. So one of the things that Mark Spector from Grand Gamers Guild is doing, which I love, is he's helping out small independent people who kickstarted their games to get their games to a broader audience by publishing them through Grand Gamers Guild. So the Belgian Beers Race was kickstarted independently. Then Grand Gamers Guild came in after the fact, after fulfillment, and got involved was like, hey, let me get this game on store shelves and so on. So this is something new Mark Spector is trying. It's also what they did for Roll Camera is another game we reviewed by them. It's the same thing. Um, Chiseled is another example. It was, again, a Kickstarter game that Grand Gamers Guild is now distrib publishing for them. BRY Games is actually the so one that I think BYR Games, Grand Gamers Guild, and yeah. Pixie Games. So BYR Games, which you'll note says Beer Games, um, is who did the Kickstarter. And Pixie Games, I'm not sure where, maybe they're publishing not in North America. Grand Gamers Guild is specifically in North America. So Grand Gamers Guild published this game. Anyway, here you have a Euro game about beer tasting in Belgium. And for people who do the beer tasting reviewing thing, they know Belgian beer is considered by most many people to be the best beer in the world. So a Euro about trying the best beer in the world. I like, I, how could I... Literally, when Mark Spector announced this game, I wrote him and said, how have you not sent this to me yet? Because, <laughs> like, is there a game that's more Mo? It was the same thing when, when, when Stonemaier Games published Kanban. And at the time, I worked in lean manufacturing. And I was like, come on, Bonacore. Like, this game is my job in board game form, including the going to the meetings at the end of the week and having to present your ideas and getting shot down by the mean boss. Like, this is my job. I totally want to review this. So I finally got to try the game. I know uh, Kevin Tech, one of our one of our our uh, uh, fans and patrons, uh, who honestly was awesome enough to mule this game to me from Gen Con, um, almost kept the copy instead. Of, they, they might not have shown up because he was so tempted by it. And I got to say, it's good. It's it's really well done. We played a four player game, Tori Cat, Deanna, and I. Um, halfway through, we did bring out the Belgian beers um, using appropriate glassware from breweries that were on the board which was neat um it's a hitchhiking game you're, you're spending three days in belgium and you're traveling around belgium on foot so you can either bike you can rent a bike you can hitchhike or you can take a bus to get between breweries 
Uh, the first person to the breweries gets, you know, collectible glassware, which is represented by a beer. Um, later, people might be able to collect coasters, but that's randomized at the beginning. How many coasters are available? So like one brewery might reward every player that goes there. The next brewery only has one coaster. So only the first two people that go there get something. And then every time you go to places, you someplace you can buy beer, someplace you can buy cheese, other place you can just taste beers. Heck, there's a place where you can't do anything. There was no action. I'm like, what do they do with this brewery? You just go take a tour. You check it out. You're like, hey, great. Look, there's a brewery. I don't know. In, in real life. Um, honestly, I could have found out because it includes a, a beer Bible that lists all the breweries. The, the scary part for me, if I won a lottery, is there's a checklist. And I'm like, now I want to go play the Belgian beer race in real life. And I literally check these off. I've been to this place. I've been to this place. Uh, the game's neat. Um, I would call it a step above Ticket to Ride, despite what the um, what the uh, Board Game Geek rating currently says. I personally went to put the weight in, and I'm getting it a bit more because, like, it literally says, um, like, ultra light, then something, then medium. Like, a medium's a three. So I'm like, I get the people rating it medium. But, like, and if you rate it light, it's a two. Like, I can't see rating it a one. So like the 2.5 makes more sense if you read what they mean, but comparing the 2.5 to other 2.5s, this is way simpler than other 2.5s. Right. Um, your big thing is deciding how to move between places. When you drink beers, your alcohol level goes up. If you bike enough, it goes down. There's some really interesting thematic things like um, you can drink on public transit, which I assume is a Belgian thing you can do. Um, you can get too drunk and you can't legally ride your bike anymore. Um, and you can actually pass out from being drunk. So that can be problematic content for a lot of people. If you've got someone who no longer drinks or is against alcohol, this is not a game to play with them. So I do think that's important. And we're going to have to remember when we do the full review to do a, a bit of a disclaimer about that, like a content warning at the beginning that this game does involve drinking alcohol. Um, the, and it doesn't sugarcoat it. Like you have a breathalyzer track yeah so interestingly apparently public drinking is uh just normal in belgium that's what i thought yeah and if i remember the drinking age is very low as well where where kids drinking is not a strange thing but yeah dan is pointing out that i had to have a chat about responsibility in adults and drinking with our 12 year old who happened to be in the room when we were playing because we were making lots of jokes about passing out and i wanted her to understand we were being silly and that's not actually funny it's a good point. She was overplaying. Uh, uh, I don't even know what she was playing Switch or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but just theme, and it was funny. Like, oh, we were playing with Tori, and Tori and I are both beer drinkers who rate beers on apps and cheers each other. And like a big part of the game was Tori trying to catch up to me, so we had to toast each other, and we almost didn't make our flight out of Belgium because we were too busy drinking beers together, which I thought was very thematic. And it has all of the breweries, but then there's some weird stuff going on, like. The, I, I complained if you watch our unboxing video. Is that live? I don't even know if that's live. I'm if our sure. unboxing video is live, you could watch it. I don't think it is. I don't even remember now. Maybe that'll be Monday. Yeah, I don't think it is yet. But anyway, in our unboxing video, I'm like, man, this board's kind of ugly. And I now respect the board, I guess would be the right term, because I found out that it was actually designed by a Belgian beer label maker. And I can totally see it. Like, it's got kind of that beer label look. And I'm like, all right, I get what you're going for. But man, the numbers on the things are small. And what we didn't realize till we started playing, the names of the breweries aren't on the map. Mm. So they're just numbers. Like it's too, like, <laughs> like at least tell me where I am. Now, yes, you could look up, you're at number 12 and grab the book and look up number 12, but you don't want to do that. And I'll admit, the first hour we played, we did that. Oh, and you're visiting the blah, 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 who is known for this. But like that fell off pretty quickly. Right. I don't know, neat game. It, 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 wasn't quite what I expected. I was expecting more of a heavier meteor euro. It's definitely lighter, but we also had a lot of fun playing it. So, excellent. All right. Well, what do you have uh, planned for the weeks ahead? So, finish off Black Brim. That's a big one. Review it next week. Um, I ooh, I don't know when it's going to fit in. We're so busy. I want to play Boba Mahjong. It's a two player only rummy Mahjong game, which sounds a bit like Point Salad. So you're making sets of three cards, right? So it's a three card run or whatever. You're making sets of three cards. But whenever you do that, you have to pick one to score at the end of the game. And then the scoring at the end of the game is kind of sushi go like. So there's all these like collecting sets, collecting patterns, collecting different types. Or, you know, the green bobas are worth this and this is worth this. 
So you're trying to complete the sets while also only picking one of those cards. So like you're picking your scoring cards and completing sets all at once. It sounds really neat. So I want to play that one. It's two player only. I like to get that in. Um, if we could get in a couple more games of Disney Smash Up, I would love to hammer that review off and get it done. I don't know if that's going to happen. What I would love to do, and I don't know if there'll be time, is unbox all these. This pile of Valeria games right here. I would like to get these unboxed so we can start trying these out. Mainly because they're just starting to hit backers right now. And it would be great if we could get some content out so people can get hyped about them before they show up. Or more importantly, the people who didn't back it know what they missed out on and can then go order them from Daily Magic Games. Plus, I love Valeria. And every single one of these features Miko's artwork. And I love Miko's artwork, but <laughs> each is designed by someone different. And that's part of the point of this line was to get different game designers to do something with Valeria, including Levi Moat, friend of ours who did Horizons. Right. And then there's Disney Epic Arena, which if I can ever get all the film off the acrylic standees, I would love to try with the kids. There you go. <laughs> All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thanks, Math Guy Dave. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Jeff and Sheila Seuss. Thank you, Seusses. And Tori, congratulations on the pregnancy announcement. Yes, congrats, both of you. You've been trying a long time. All that money and crap you went through is finally paying off. William Fisher, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to slam that portcullis. So the doors are closed. You can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Before you go, don't forget to visit patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop to show your support, which would be awesome. Um, honestly, stuff in this room, the lights that are here, like so that is part because of you and our other awesome patrons. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our Pedo Suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.